this is uh, assumed to be open. Remember, our hypothesis is that f is closed. Therefore, the component of f must be open. Uh, we know that Uh, for that there exists an R such that x minus R x plus R is in the component of F. Okay? So, all, everybody in here must be inside the component of F. And of course, that's going to be our contradiction because the sequence xn is in f, and therefore, at some, after some rank, it must be here. So it's going to be in f and also not in f. That's our contradiction. Okay? So let's just write it. Uh, we know that there exists an n, so that if n is bigger than capital N, then x minus xn is going to be small than R. Uh, okay, we just use, we just write the definition of convergence with epsilon equal R. That's all we're doing. And therefore, so what we know is that Xn belongs to uh, X minus R, X plus R for all N bigger than capital N. And uh, so Xn must belong to the complement of F, right? Because this integral is in the complement of F. But also to F. So we get our contradiction. And the statement of the, the implication is proved. OK? It's not possible that a sequence uh, in F converging to X has X not in F. X must be in F. Otherwise, we reach a contradiction. Now let's do the other implication. Let's assume that this is a true statement and let's prove that F must be closed. So okay, again, uh, let's do a proof by contradiction. Assume that F is not closed. Okay, we have this property and we assume that F is not closed. Then it uh, uh, equivalently it means that the complement of F is not closed, is not open. Okay, if this guy is open, F is closed. That's the definition. So this guy is not open, which means that we need to contradict the definition of being open. So there must be A in the complement of F such that for all R a minus R, A plus R, is not included in the complement of F. Okay, because if it's if it's open, you know that there is an R, so that this inclusion is true. So if it's not open, it means that you cannot find an R, uh, or yeah, you cannot find an R. So it means that for all R, this is not a true statement. Now, if you are not included in the complement of F, it means that you must have some elements in F, right? Because you are either in the complement of F or F. If you are not entirely in the complement of F, it means that at least some elements are in F. So, uh, 
another way to, to say the same thing is that for every r, a minus r, a plus r, intersect f must be non-empty. Because if it's empty, it means that your interval is entirely in the complement of f. So it's not empty. So what we do is we construct a sequence. We take, for instance, r equal to 1 over n. And there exists xn for each r belonging to a minus r, a plus r. Well, so now let's, let's put 1 over n. Intersect f. So what do we have? We have a sequence xn, which is squeezed between a minus 1 over n and a plus 1 over n, which means that xn converges to a. We have xn belonging to f, but a does not belong to f. Remember, we started with a belonging to the complement of f. So this is contradicting our hypothesis here, because we have built a sequence, which is in f, which converges, but converges outside f. So this is contradicting this statement here. OK, so we have our contradiction. Okay, the contradiction is that we have found a sequence xn in f converging to a, but a does not belong to f. That's, that's exactly the, we are contradicting this uh, statement here. Questions? So that's, that's a nice characterization of closed sets. Okay, we'll use that when we, we want to, to use that a set is uh, closed, we'll use this characterization. Of course, we can always use that, uh, the, the definition for an open set. But this is nice because it uses sequences. So we can just go back to sequences and, uh, uh, and prove things about sequences, which is convenient many times. That was, yeah, then if that's the definition you prove, that to be open means that you can find an open interval inside the, I mean, the two, the two points of view are equivalent. So you can start with one and prove the other one. Usually people start by defining open, but it's a little awkward. I mean, this is an easier, uh, somehow it uses sequences, so it's uh, easier to manipulate than the other one. So maybe that's why. OK, then I think there was this series of uh, sets we needed to show that they all generated the Borel sigma algebra. Uh, let's see. So we had the following statement. Uh, so we take E2 to be the set of uh, A. So this time it's closed. A, B closed, where A is less than B. And we'd like to show that the small sigma algebra generated by these closed sets is actually the Borel sigma algebra. So we need to do a double inclusion. 
one uh, thing which is helpful is to know that AB uh, can be written as the intersection of A minus 1 over N, B plus 1 over N over ON. So let, let's prove this uh, claim first. Well, <coughs> one inclusion is clear. AB is certainly included in A minus 1 over N, B plus 1 over N for every N. This is a bigger set than this one. Okay, you are increasing the set from the left and right, so you get something bigger. Okay, so because it's true for every n, you can say that it is also true uh, for the intersection. Okay, if you are inside every set, then you are inside the intersection of these sets. That's the definition of being inside an intersection. Now, conversely, for the other inclusion, uh, maybe it's better to take an x in here, that x belong to this intersection, which means that x is strictly between a minus 1 over n, b plus 1 over n, but this is true for every n. So we can pass to the limit. Let n go to infinity, and we get a smaller than equal, smaller than equal, and b. So this shows that our x belongs to a, b closed. And now we can, uh, so we claim that this implies this inclusion. There are other ways to prove it, too, but uh, that's, that's one way. So you have a double inclusion. Therefore, my claim is correct. Okay, so what does this tell me? Well, what's this, this guy here, so when I look at this intersection, I'm doing uh, an infinite intersection of open sets. And therefore, um, this must be in the Borel sigma algebra. Because when I do, I know that my, my Borel sigma algebra is stable under intersections. Okay, what, we, what the definition says is that if I have a sequence of uh, elements, then the union belongs to the sigma algebra, right? But then you take the covalence of this guy and you get an intersection. And you know also that this is stable under complement, so the intersection also must be in your sigma in your sigma algebra. There's no way around that. Okay? So that's all I'm using here. I'm taking elements and uh, I'm doing intersections, though I cannot get out of that set. That's not possible. Therefore, uh, it, show, it tells us what? It tells us that E2 is inside BR. Okay? Every AB is a Borel set. That's all I'm saying. But then we have a lemma that tells us if my set is inside the sigma algebra, the sigma algebra generated by my set is also inside it. Okay? So when I do the smaller sigma algebra, it must also be inside BR. That's not completely trivial, because I'm increasing by quite a bit this set. Okay, this guy is in here, but this is a lot bigger than this. So that's why I need the lemma. 
Okay? And the reason why the lemma works is because this guy here is really the intersection of all sigma algebras that contain E2. That's why. And therefore, it's an intersection that contains over all sigma algebras, in particular this one. So of course you are inside this guy, because you are taking all the, the intersection over all sigma algebras. So you are inside a particular one. That's all. So we get one inclusion. We need to prove the other one. So to prove the other one, we do what? Well, we write that the open sets can also be written as uh, union or intersection or complement of closed set. So for instance, so let's see. So for the, for the other inclusion, so now we want to prove that E2, uh, that BR is inside M of E2. That's what we'd like to prove. We say, well, that AB is really, and there are many ways to do this. This is one way. Is minus infinity A closed, complement of that, intersect, um, B Okay, so does this work? What I'm saying is that I want to be strictly bigger than A and I want to be strictly less than B, which is exactly what this set is. Now, what's minus infinity A? That's the union over N of minus n a. No, because I want the reverse now. I want to show that this is generated by open sets. So now I want to show that my open set can be written as closed sets. So you see it's a symmetric uh, argument that I need. So do we agree on this union there, that minus infinity A must be the union over N of minus N A? And always, I mean, if you have any doubt, do a double inclusion. It's very easily done. So let's do it, for instance, here. If X belongs to minus infinity A, it means that X is strictly less than A. Uh, it means that, and also, x must be bigger than minus n for some n. What property am I using here when I claim that x must be bigger than minus n for some n? It's the Archimedean property we are using because uh, we can say that minus x needs to be uh, smaller than a certain uh, natural. Okay, there is a natural bigger than natural than minus x. So it's the Archimedean property that we are using here. And therefore, x must belong to, uh, we said, minus n a for some n. And the, co the converse is even easier because if I'm in here, I'm below A and, there is, uh, and that's it. I mean, that's, that's all I'm saying. I'm saying that if I'm here, then I'm here. And that's, that's because this set is included in this one for every n. But maybe I should write it. So for the other inclusion, we can simply observe that minus n a is included in minus infinity a for every n. And so the union of these guys must be 
in this set as well. And here I didn't quite finish, but if if I have that x belong to minus n a for some n, that's exactly the definition of x belongs to the union of over all n of minus n a. Okay, so this tells me so minus infinity a is the union of minus n a. Uh, and this guy is in E. This is in E2. The union of guys in E2 is in M of E2. So this belongs to M of E2. Right? You do exactly the same thing with this other piece. B plus infinity can also be written exactly in the symmetric way. Bn instead of minus Na. So this guy also is in M of E2. OK, am I going too fast? Do, do we agree on this claim here? that this belongs to M of E2? Okay. So if this belongs to M of E2, then the complement also belongs to M of E2. And then I do the same thing on the other side. The positive infinity is the union of Bn, which also belongs to M of E2. And the complement of this guy belongs to M of E2 as well. So when we are looking at the intersection of the two elements in M of E2, we get that uh, AB belongs to M of E2. But now this proves that every open interval AB belongs to M of E2, which means then that E1 is included in M of E2. And then you take M, you say that M of E1 is included in M of E2. But we have, we have already shown that M of E1 is the Borel sigma algebra, is BR. So BR is included in M of E2. And we get our double inclusion. This shows that, M of, that E2 generates the Borelians, or the Borel sets. So it's, it's uh, uh, a manipulation of these uh, different intersections and unions that you have to do to, to prove these things. Questions? You don't seem jumping with joy by my solution. Maybe there are shorter ways to do it, but it's, I mean, it's in the same spirit. You, you need to do something of this type. Did you find better solutions? OK. Well, I'll have a look at it. Same flavor. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think you can avoid that.
Okay, let's do another one. Let's look at uh, the set E3. So A is open, B closed, and we have A small and B. And this time, I claim that AB is the intersection of A B plus 1 over N. So let's check this uh, first claim. Uh, a, B is included in A, B plus 1 over N for every N. Okay? You are enlarging to the right, you get something bigger. So A, B is included in the intersection of these guys. So this gives you one inclusion. For the other inclusion, you take x belonging to intersection. You pass to the limit. Nothing changes here because you don't have anything going on, right? You don't have any n here. So, but on this case here, you get a large inequality x must be between a and b. So you show that x belongs to a, b closed, and we have the other inclusion, which is a, b, that we have intersection, a, b plus 1 over n, which is included in a, b. So we have our double inclusion, therefore my claim is correct. Then from here it's straightforward because this is of course an open set. So this thing here must belong to BR. Okay? So therefore A B belongs to BR for every A and B, and you, you get that E3 is included in BR, and M of E3 is included in BR by the lemma. Okay, so you get one inclusion. Now, to do the other one, you need to write your open set as uh, something belonging to E3. So it turns out that so for the for the other inclusion, you write that your A B open is actually intersection of A B minus one over n. Is correct? Oh, I, sh I need to close it here. This is not working. Okay, if we can show this, we are done. Because it means that every, open, that every element of E1 is in M of E3. And that's all we need. Okay, so is this correct? Uh, let's see. So if I have... So if I have x in, well, one, one thing is clear, is that a b minus 1 over n is always included in a b. All of them are smaller than a b for every n. So the intersection must be 
included in AB. Keep writing this. I mean closed here. Doesn't really matter. But well, that's what I want. Okay, so one inclusion is clear. Now for the other inclusion, let's take X in AB. No, but that's, this is not going to work. Uh, I, what do I want? I, I want an union here. It's going to be, uh, I want, uh, if it's in, yeah, I want a union here. Okay? Uh, the intersection is not going to work. Uh, um, is it? Okay, uh, what's the problem? If I if I take someone in AB, it's not going to be smaller than, no. Okay, no, it's the union that I need. So, sorry about that. Let's try this again. Okay, so, uh, but the same argument I just had works in the sense that A, B minus 1 over N is included in AB. And therefore, each one of them is included in AB. And therefore, the, the union is certainly included there, too. OK, they are all small. So the, the union is in there. Now, if I take an X in AB, then uh, I claim that there is n such that x is smaller than b minus 1 over n. There are several ways to see this. If not, so by contradiction, we would get that uh, for every n, x is bigger than b minus 1 over n. OK, that's the contradiction of this guy. We pass to the limit, x would be bigger than or equal to b. We get a contradiction. OK, I want x to be strictly less than b. So this is a true statement, which means that x belongs to the union of these guys. And I have my, uh, my uh, statement here, which is true. And this shows that E1, again, is included in M of E3, and therefore M of E1 is included in M of E3, which tells me that BR is included in M of E3. Okay. The others are quite similar, so I'm not going to do them. But you, I guess you get the picture now of how you need to proceed for these things. Other homework questions? I think that's all I assign. Okay, so um, where were we?
So let's go to section 1.3, which is measures. So we give ourselves a, a set X and M a sigma algebra on X. Then we define mu is a measure on X M if uh, mu is a function that goes from M to zero infinity and note that this is included so infinity is a valid uh, value for my function mu with the following properties we need first that mu of the empty set is zero not really very difficult to agree and then we also need that if uh, we have a countable sequence of uh, elements in M that are disjoint, so meaning that EI intersect EJ is empty when I is different from J, then mu of the union is the sum of the mu's. Okay, so you give yourself a set of subsets of X and we've, which is a sigma algebra M has the particular properties of sigma algebra and you define on that a measure so you are measuring these sets, that's what you are doing the measure of the empty set is zero, always and the measure of the union of these joint sets is the sum of the measures, of course I mean that, that makes sense, that's what you would expect for a measure Okay, so many times the problem will start with a triplet. X and mu will be a measure space. Okay, so if uh, I don't know, is measure space? I would call it measurable space, but. At this time of the day, my English uh, starts to get worse, so I won't uh, argue too much for this. Now, uh, another important property, another important uh, uh, definition is the following one. X and mu is sigma finite if uh, if there exists a sequence EI in M 
such that uh, the union of the EIs is all of X and each one of these guys has a measure which is finite. Okay? You're not asking much, much when you're asking for a sigma finite. You're asking to be able to decompose your space in finite pieces. Okay, so uh, what, let's maybe let's talk about an example. Uh, so an example, a fundamental example, one of the fundamental examples is the Lebesgue measure. So usually the back measure is is uh, is uh, called lowercase m, and you should see a definite difference between this m and this one. They're not the same, but I'll try to make it uh, more different. So uh, the Lebesgue measure on uh, an interval a b will be b minus a, for instance. Okay, and if you want to measure the whole line, it's going to be infinite. Not, uh, that's because it's the length. So the length of an infinite uh, interval is going to be infinite. Uh, now, it, it is sigma finite because you can write R as the union of what? What do you suggest? What, uh, what how can I write R as the union of sets whose measure is finite? Yes, we could do negative N, N, exactly. Again, yeah, there are other possibilities, of course, but that's, that's maybe the simplest one. And M of minus n n is 2n, according to my definition, which of course is finite. So this shows that M is sigma finite. Okay. Of course, you have uh, the right, and you should be suspicious of what I'm telling you about the Lebesgue measure, because I'm only defining it on intervals. And that intervals is not a sigma algebra, the set of intervals. What happens on the sigma algebra? And what is the sigma algebra? Okay, how do you define it otherwise? So that's a difficult problem, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about it. We won't go into details, but to extend the Lebesgue measure from intervals to Borel sets, and we actually need more than Borel sets, uh, is, is quite a, a, a challenge to do. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit. It's done in detail in the book. I'll, uh, I'll come back to this. But at this point, this is not well defined because we haven't talked about sigma algebra. And we haven't said what, what's the behavior of this thing on a sigma algebra. So that's one example. Uh, another example, so in this example, x is r, of course, and uh, the, the sigma algebra uh, m is going to be br. Another example is on the naturals. Okay, so we go at the other extreme. Let's look at the naturals. And uh, as our sigma algebra, we could take simply all the subsets of the naturals. The naturals are nice. We can, we can look at uh, the whole subsets. We know it's a sigma algebra, uh, but it's not a nasty one. Nothing really bad can happen in a discrete set. So that's fine. We can measure everything there. And for mu, mu of A is going to be the cardinality of A. 
Okay, you count the number of points that you have in your subset. And again, we could write n as uh, the union of finite subsets. So what do you suggest this time? What, what can we take to cover all the naturals? From, yeah, we could, f from 1 to n, we could take n as well. Okay, we can, there are many possible choices. And what's, what's mu of a singleton n? What's this equal to? 1. Okay, because you count the number of people in there, so you get only 1. Now, mu of the whole thing here is going to be infinity. It's an infinite set. It has infinitely many points. Therefore, it's going to be infinite. So again, we have that. So this is called the counting measure. Is sigma finite. So when I'll ask you about counterexamples, show that something happens, think about these two examples. These are really the two fundamental examples. They're also good to keep in mind because uh, we'll, uh, we'll, some of the results will be rather abstract. Well, let's try to apply them to the examples and it will make things a little more concrete. Okay, so back to uh, the properties of measures. So properties, uh, let's give us the triplet x and mu. So that's a measure space. And let's, uh, uh, so we have several properties. Assume that, so how do I to say that? Uh, right. Okay, so one thing which is useful is to note that if E and F are in M, then mu of E, for instance, is going to be mu of EF. So this means intersection of E and F. Okay, so when I write nothing, it means that it's uh, an intersection which is applied plus mu of E F complement. That's a triviality really because the proof of that goes like this. E is E F union E F complement. So what I'm saying here is that if I'm in E, I'm either in E, in e and F or I'm in E and not in F. Okay? What I'm saying is that E is, you, this part is E complement of F and this part is E F. And that's, that's all that can happen. Now, what's interesting here is that these two guys are disjoint. I cannot be in F and in the complement of F at the same time. Therefore, they are disjoint and that my, additive, my addition property works. So, mu of E 
is the sum mu e f plus mu e f complement. So second property, if E is included in F, where well, should do the reverse? Yeah, let's do. If F is included in E, then mu of F is smaller than mu of E. Okay. You expect that property for a measure, of course, and uh, it, uh, it is true. And the proof, we can do the proof using A. We can simply say that mu of E is mu EF plus mu EF complement. So mu of E is larger than mu EF. Because I'm getting rid of this piece, and this piece is positive. Right? Mu of something is always positive. Therefore, I have this. And the intersection of EF is F, because we're assuming that F is in E. So we get our mu of F. And we're done. C mu of union of EI is less than the sum of the mu's. Okay. We already have a relationship between the mu of the union and the mu of the EIs, but when they are disjoint. When they are not disjoint, what can I do? Well, if we think about it, when I'm doing the sum of mu, mu of EI, I'm counting the intersections twice. Therefore, I should get something bigger. Okay? See, if I, if I do uh, mu of phi plus mu of f, I'm counting this set twice. So the inequality should be on this uh, direction. So how do we do that? Well, we need, so the proof of C Let uh, F1 equal to E1, F2 equal to E2 intersect complement of E1. Yeah, and so on. E F3 is going to be E3 complement of the union of E, well, E1 uh, union E2 Fn is going to be En intersect the union from i equal 1 to, a, to n minus 1 of Ei complement. Okay, every time I'm throwing out all the sets with lower index. And the point is that I'm going to, to write, uh, the point is that the Fs are disjoint now, and their union is the same as before. So we, we, we need to do a little bit to show this.
So, two things to show. First, uh, the Fi are disjoint. Well, uh, how can we? Well, the thing is that we are uh, excluding. So what are we doing? Yeah, we are we are excluding a bigger set. Hmm. How can we write this? Well, it's it's better to look at it than really write a formal proof here because it's going to be a little messy. But if you look at the way this thing is constructed, I first take E1, and then I exclude E1. So these two are clearly disjoint. This one is disjoint with this one because I'm excluding not only E1, but E1 and E2. And so on. So I keep excluding more and more. So once... Uh, uh, I cannot have, I cannot have a, 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 I cannot have anything in my intersection, because um, I'll be throwing out uh, the thing that made up my my uh, my component. See, um, maybe I can try to write it. If my fi is going to be ei intersect the union of Ej for J from 1 to I minus 1. Complement. Now let's take, uh, let's take K bigger than I. Then Fk is Ek intersect the union from well, J equal 1 to K minus 1 of a j. But k is bigger than i, which means that e i is here. So you are throwing out e i. On the other hand, f i is in e i. So you you don't uh, you don't have an intersection. You see, f i is in e i. And Fk is in the complement of Ei, which means that Fi Fk must be empty. Okay, that was my first point. The Fi are disjoint. My second point is that uh, the union of Fi is actually the union of Ei. <coughs> Where one thing is clear, Fi is always included in Ei for every end. So the union of Fi's is included in the union of Ei's. So this, in, uh, this uh, inclusion is clear. OK. Now, if I take an x for the other inclusion, Let's take x in the union of the eyes. OK. Uh, then what do I want to say? I can throw this away. Uh, so there are two, there are two possibilities. Either x belongs to E1, which is the same thing as F1, and we are done. So 
x belong to the union of the fi's, which is what I wanted, or x does not belong to e1. But it still belongs to the union. And I claim that there is a minimum, a minimum i, well, such that, which depends on x, such that uh, x belongs to E of I X, but X does not belong to E J for all J less than I X. We know that X does not belong to E1, okay? But X must belong to, to one of the E I's. I call the first one i of x. Now, how do I know that I have a minimum there? What's the principle I'm using? What do you know about non-empty subsets of naturals? The well-ordering principle tells you that there is always a minimum. Okay, that's exactly what we're looking at. We're looking at all the i's such that x belongs to e i. Well, this set has a minimum because it's not empty. We know that x belongs to at least one of them. So that's uh, the definition of being the minimum, which means that x belongs to e i x intersect union uh, e i e j complement which is exactly f of i x Right, it doesn't belong to anyone before that, so it doesn't belong to their union, but it does belong to that guy. So that's that's exactly our f. That's our definition of f of i x. So I'm either extremely careful because I have spent half an hour doing this, or the book is extremely quick, but uh, because he doesn't say anything why this is equal. <coughs> so I'll let you decide. Okay, so where were we? we? So we just proved this claim here. Okay? And in case you forgot what we were trying to do, what we are trying to do is that the measure of the union of the EIs is smaller than the measure of the, of, uh, the sum of the measures of the uh, EIs. That's what we are trying to do. But now we are done. Once we have this, it's very easy. It's very easy because uh, we can write that mu of the union of the EIs is equal to mu of the union of the FIs. That these are, by the property of mu, because they are disjoint, this is the sum mu of FI. But now, mu of fi is certainly less than mu of e i. Right? Because fi is a subset of e i. Look the way it's built. Okay? fi is an intersection of e i and something else, so it's included in e i.
Therefore, the mu of the union is less than mu of here. Of course, we, we may very well be, be saying here that infinity is less than infinity. That's fine. We may be adding infinity here. That's okay. It doesn't bother us. Okay, it's well defined. Maybe we should stop for 10 minutes. <laughs>